welcome everybody to the official launch of the e-learning course on the um, transparency framework for forestry under the Paris Agreement. Uh, this e-learning course is actually the result of a um, collaborative effort involving the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change, the Global Environment Fund, and the FAO e-learning Academy. Let me start by introducing myself. I'm Christina Petraki, and I head the FAO e-learning Academy. Let me just um, say a few words on what the Academy does. We basically offer uh, over uh, 350 multilingual e-learning courses, which are uh, offered free of charge as a global public good. And this, uh, this new course is part of, of the offerings. Um, I would like to also mention that the FAO e-learning Academy regularly organizes uh, international technical webinars uh, with uh, our um, partners, Agrinium, and with the United Nations uh, Economic and Social Commission for the Pacific, uh, and that what, uh, as well as e-learning courses and other capacity development uh, interventions. What I wanted to mention is that in all our initiatives, activities, e-learning courses, MOOCs, blended learning programs, there is one common thread, which is sustainability. And uh, this course also on the transparency framework on forestry contributes also to, to sustainability and to a better management of, uh, uh, of data and information related to forestry. So I would like to uh, now give the floor to our moderator today, who is uh, Khalil uh, Walji. And um, today we have a very interesting agenda with a number of experts from both our partners that, are, that have contributed to the course. So uh, Khalil, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. I hope everyone can hear me properly. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Thank you all for joining us. It is really fantastic to see over 200 participants here. Uh, it's tremendous and I think it just shows the excitement around the topic that we're discussing today. Uh, we've brought together an impressive and broad group of speakers to discuss open and transparent forest data, setting the course for a green future under the Paris Agreement. Um, so today in this technical webinar, through both presentations and through a moderated dialogue, we will try to unpack and cover a range of topics. Um, we want to start by discussing the importance of the enhanced transparency framework under Article 3, 13 of the Paris Agreement. And to do this, we are really delighted to be joined by Dr. Donald Cooper, and Ms. Lisa Hanley from the UNFCCC. Following the first presentation, we want to provide an overview and introduce the Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency, uh, a program under the Global Environment Facility. And for that, we have been joined by another two colleagues, Ms. Milena Gonzalez and Mr. Pascal Martinez. And finally, to round out the group of presentations, we would like to focus on the CIPIT, the CBIT Forest Global Project, and to help us officially launch the three brand new e-learning modules, we are delighted to be joined by Ms. Mete Wilkie and Ms. Rocio Condor. Following the presentations, we will host a moderated dialogue and that's where you guys come in. We will take questions from the floor. Um, before I jump in to the actual content though, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Khalil Walji. I work with the National Forest Monitoring Team here at FAO. And I'll be your moderator, your asker of questions, and generally your company for today's session. I am like perhaps some of you, a non-expert on most of these topics, but I hope that through our dialogue, we can uncover and further understand some of these themes that are being brought forward by our esteemed colleagues. But I also wanna take an opportunity to recognize all of you, our audience, uh, with over 260, as of right now, uh, speakers, we're, we're bound to be coming from a really broad diversity and mix of backgrounds. Some of you may be experts and joining us from country offices, as I've already seen by the chat. Um, and some of you might be more generally interested in forests and their contribution to the Paris Agreement. Um, and we hope that many of you are younger colleagues, like myself, considered youth. And it just so happens that today also is World Youth Skills Day, which is a great reminder that we must focus on building capacity at all levels and to ensure that everyone has the tools and is enabled to take climate action, something that is needed more now more than ever. Now, speaking of experience and ex expertise, Given the reality of the past three to four months in Zoom calls, we presume that many of you are well-versed in Zoom etiquette, but just a very quick refresher. Uh, during the presentations, please place any questions that you have into the Q&A box. Um, 
if there is a question that's been posed that you are also thinking about, please utilize the upvote function. And this will really bring, bring the most important questions to the top of the, the aisle. Uh, we're joined today in moderation by my colleague, Emily Donegan from FAO, and she'll be helping us select the questions for the panel. So I hope that gives a, a very clear overview of how we'll spend the next 1.4 hours together um, and how we can interact through the Zoom platform. So without delaying any further, I'd like to welcome our first group of speakers from the UNFCCC. Um, we'll be hearing first from Dr. Donald Cooper, who serves as the Director of the Transparency Division at the UNFCCC, which supports the intergovernmental processes related to measurement reporting and verification under Kyoto, as well as the Enhanced Transparency Framework under the Paris Agreement. Dr. Cooper has a career filled with extensive experience supporting and leading projects and programs related to environmental health and science, as well as working at high levels of government. With such vast knowledge and experience, we look forward to his remarks. And following Dr. Cooper, we will also hear from Ms. Lisa Hanle, who currently leads the newly established Enhanced Transparency Framework and Coordination Unit, also under the Transparency Division of the UNFCCC. She coordinates and facilitates the Secretariat-wide efforts on development and implementation under the new ETF of the Paris Agreement and has over 20 years of experience working at the national and international level of reporting, reviewing activities related to greenhouse gas inventories, amongst many more. That's a mouthful, my apologies. <laughs> but uh, Donald and Lisa, we greatly appreciate you joining us today and I turn the floor to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, I have to apologize. Um, Lisa is going to deal with the UNFCCC contribution. I'm just crashing the party. Um, I was discussing this matter with Patricia Espinosa a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she's the executive secretary of the uh, Climate Change Secretariat. And uh, we could not let the opportunity go by without expressing <clears throat> our admiration and gratitude to FAO for the whole array of leadership roles it has taken. It is quite extraordinary that you are an example to everyone about taking the charge that the countries have given you and running with it. We at the uh, UNFCCC are happy to be your number two on any occasion to do whatever it is to um, help you enhance whatever actions you wish to take. The work that you are doing now builds not only specific capacity, but general capacity in one of the most challenging and potentially rewarding areas, dealing with forests. You are building the ability to ensure that all countries are contributing in all sectors. It is difficult to address the forestry sector, and with your help, countries are able to do that. Well, I only had a minute, so it was always going to be limited what I could tell you, but we are extraordinarily impressed, pleased. I wish to thank you and encourage you to continue doing what you are doing and more. So to address the enhanced transparency framework component, I now hand over to Lisa. Lisa? Thank you, Don, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. And I would just like to echo Don's comments and thank FAO for the work that has gone into this, um, this uh, effort today. Um, it's been a great collaboration and we look forward to many more such collaborations in the coming years. Forestry is a, a complicated <laughs> sector and so it's, it's great that the work is, is starting and it's starting now and we look forward to, to working with you. I only have 13 minutes left in my presentation so um, I know that we can only do so much in this amount of time, and I can't seem to fast uh, to forward. There we go. We can only do so much um, for the, it, about the enhanced transparency framework, but I hope we can provide you some insight today. And then more importantly, to know that you can come to us if there are questions going forward and talk to us. Um, as Don said, we hope that we are the best number two around <laughs> to help you in, in your efforts. Um, and because there is a short amount of time, I thought we could start with some of the key messages. Um, first, the enhanced transparency framework is the foundation of the Paris Agreement. Um, I know that the expertise on this webinar um, vary. And so I think one of the most important things is to understand what is transparency 
itself um, in order to first then see what is enhanced under the Paris Agreement. And transparency is really about the provision of information on climate action. Um, and in, in doing so, you're providing information on greenhouse gas emissions and removals, um, perhaps policies and measures in your country, um, finance, technology transfer, capacity building needs. It's about providing this information in an open manner so that the public, um, others, can see what your country is doing. Um, it, it's transparent information. Um, we'll talk about how that is enhanced under the Paris Agreement. The second key message is that forests play a key role in all aspects of the, of the Paris Agreement, whether it's in the targets that countries are taking, um, the reporting of emissions and removals from the forestry sector, um, or looking at opportunities to enhance ambition over time. And, and one of the key messages that I really, really liked from the, uh, the training course was that a robust national forest management system is fundamental to achieving multiple national goals. Um, from the Secretariat, we often talk about, well, how do you meet the reporting requirements under the UNFCCC? What, what is required to be reported? Um, and it's important uh, for, for transparency to report this information, but what's most important is that the data and the systems that you're developing to report information can be used internally. It helps in countries to identify uh, mitigation actions, opportunities for further um, reductions over time. So it, it's not just about reporting, but it's gathering the necessary information and developing the institutions um, to help you manage your domestic policy and achieve domestic goals. And the third key message is that uh, building the skill set now through training, such as this program, um, will position you not only to support the current measurement reporting and verification system under the convention, but also to the enhanced transparency framework. Um, in terms of the, the Paris Agreement and the basics, um, it, it's starting with the, the, the communication of a nationally determined contribution. Um, as many of you know, 2020 is a big year where countries are submitting new or updated NDCs. And this is really identifying what the country will do to achieve mitigation actions um, over an, a certain period of time. And as you know, forests can play a key role in, 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 this, in this component. I think I, it's risky to say a statistic, but I think I saw that around 31% of the nationally determined contributions have an ele element of forestry in them. Um, so it, it's key to this element. Um, after the, the NDC is communicated, countries will uh, identify policies and measures and implement actions to achieve those goals. Uh, meanwhile, tracking their progress towards their goals, um, accounting for whether or not they're on track and whether or not over time they've achieved those goals. That information is then submitted in a report. And this is where we start the enhanced transparency framework. Every two years, beginning at the end of uh, December 2024 at the latest, countries will submit a biennial transparency report. And this is including information on greenhouse gas emissions and removals. Um, it will include information on the, the target, um, tracking progress towards the target, adaptation actions in the country, the finance technology transfer, all of that. Um, this, is the, this is the reporting element. Review teams will then come together and they will assess the reports submitted by countries um, and to determine whether the country was first meeting the requirements of further reporting but then also importantly, helping them um, to uh, improve over time. So if uh, reporting requirements aren't being met, um, these expert review teams will work with the country and really see what are the capacity building needs. The, uh, after the report is drafted, um, countries will have an opportunity to showcase their actions, showcase what they're doing to achieve their, their NDCs through a facilitated multilateral consideration of progress. Um, and, and this is really an opportunity for other countries to ask the party what they've done, um, to, to look, look for um, perhaps opportunities for further collaboration, um, and, and to really just have an exchange. Um, every five years, there'll be a global stock take where um, you're, not, you're moving on to looking at the, uh, all countries and whether all countries are on track to meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement. So it's not about, well, has one country um, met the requirements, but collectively, are all countries on a path to meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement? 
Um, and here again, forestry can be an element of that process as um, you can look at mitigation options or adaptation options to enhance ambition over time. Um, based on the outcome of this global stock take, this global consideration of information, um, countries will have a sense, are we on track or are we not on track? And the idea being that if not on track, their countries in their next nationally determined contributions would look to enhance ambition. And again, this may be <laughs> a little bit complicated, but it's just to give you an idea of what is the enhanced transparency framework and how are we moving from what's happening now to what will happen um, starting um, at the latest in 2024. As uh, many of you know, there's currently two systems of reporting, one for developed countries and one for developing. Um, every, every year, developed countries submit an uh, annual greenhouse gas inventory. Every two years, they submit a biennial report. They, every four years, submit national communications. Um, developing countries, similarly, um, submit a BUR every two years. Um, they submit national communications. And then also um, forest reference levels and red plus results. Um, that information is currently reviewed. Um, there are two different tracks, one for developed countries now, where there's a technical analysis of information focused mostly on enhancing capacity and, and improving reporting over time. And there's a review process for developed countries. And then there's a, a, a showcase, a facilitative sharing of views or multilateral assessment where there are public opportunities during the COP sessions um, for countries to engage. So these two track approach, two tracks under the current uh, measurement reporting and verification system are going to combine into one track that is applicable to all countries. Um, so under the Paris Agreement, under the, this agreement, the enhanced element, the enhanced transparency framework is that all countries will submit a greenhouse gas inventory every two years and be required to track progress towards their target. Um, developed countries will be required to report information on finance, technology transfer, and capacity building needs, um, or, I'm sorry, provided and, um, to developing countries, whereas developing countries will provide information on what their needs are um, and what capacity building and finance they have received. Um, all countries will then undergo a review process, um, and then all countries will undergo a facilitative um, multilateral consideration of progress. I think when you look about what's enhanced, um, the requirements for developed countries under the ETF are very similar. And there are some differences um, and there are elements around the tracking of progress towards the NDC target that will be new for all countries. Um, but there's largely, largely a lot of similarities. For developing countries, there are um, additional reporting requirements, new reporting requirements that are gonna um, require capacity building um, support. And I think one of the big elements of the Paris Agreement is that there are flexibility provisions embedded in, this, in the system for those developing countries that need it um, in light of their capacities. And you will find that these um, flexibility provisions, they are associated with um, things where, that are new. Um, for example, the use of the 2006 IPCC guidelines, that will be a big area for developing countries and capacity building. Some countries use it already, but it will, um, it will be required under the Paris Agreement. Reporting on projections, that's a, that's a new area. Um, the tracking of progress for developing countries um, will be new. Um, the whole review process, again, it's, it's a very different type of review process under the Paris Agreement. Um, it's a very valuable opportunity to enhance reporting over time, but it will be new for developing countries. And so you will find flexibility provisions there to help in this transition. But over time, the idea is that we will have improved reporting um, based, on, based, on this, based on this process. And the final point I would make on this slide is that um, it's important to remember that for developed countries, we have had this process for over 20 years. And so what it's like now is not what it was like 20 years ago. And I, you'll see the same um, improvement over time I think under the Paris Agreement, there'll be a lot of learning as, as we go. And finally, uh, I would just end by saying the technical experts are needed. And this is why we think this kind of a course is so valuable, providing the background knowledge, providing um, support on forestry. Um, it, 
because experts are needed, whether you're an inventory or a BTR compiler, um, it's important to understand the, the, how forests are related to the enhanced transparency framework or how the enhanced transparency framework is related to the Paris Agreement. Um, if you're a reviewer, this is a, a, an illustration of a review team under an inventory. Um, this, these experts are needed to review the process. Um, and it's, it, it's, uh, we probably will need probably about twice as many experts as we currently need. And our hope is that after you all, <laughs> as the audience, um, take courses such a these, as these, that you will then register and identify ways to become a reviewer under the official UNFCCC process. Um, either now um, or, or towards, the, towards the future. Overall, anything countries and individuals can do now um, to be involved in the MRV process is good preparation for the Enhanced Transparency Framework. So we look forward to working, working with all of you and seeing all of you in one of these pictures in the, in the years to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah, and thank you so much, Donald, as well, for your opening remarks and for crashing the party. We greatly appreciate your presence. Um, yeah, thank you for covering the basics, as you put it, uh, Lisa, in, in your presentation. Um, I quite like the fifth slide, which I think really visualized uh, this transition process that will be happening between now and 2020 and 2024, and some of the implications for the developing and developed countries as well. But I think we can dive into that a bit more during the discussion. Um, so for now, I think having covered the basics of the convention uh, and understanding how the enhanced transparency framework fits there, um, it's a good moment to transition and explore how these decisions then translate to some action at a national level and at a global level. Um, so to do so, we are joined today by two colleagues from the Global Environment Facility, uh, Ms. Milena Gonzalez, uh, who is a climate change specialist in the programs unit of the GEF. Um, she reviews climate change mitigation project proposals from various countries and works on topics related to Jeff's role as a financial mechanism for the United Nations Climate Change Convention. Uh, Milena is also joined today by Mr. Pascal Martinez, also from the Jeff, who focuses on land use issues and particularly forest and agriculture. And he contributes to the implementation of the Jeff strategy supporting development country, developing countries to meet their commitments in the framework of the international environmental agreements. Elena and Pascal, we thank you for making time to join us today and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I will start the presentation and then I will have Pascal uh, take over. So you can also hear a little bit from both of us. So as Khalil mentioned, my name is Milena Gonzalez. Uh, I work at the Global Environment Facility as a climate change specialist and I'll be introducing the Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency. And thankfully coming after Lisa, um, it was a great segue to say uh, this is one of the ways in which many countries have been getting more involved in the MRV. So next slide, please. So the establishment of the CBIT, and I will continue to use the word CBIT uh, from now on, but it's the Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency. Transparency, as Lisa said, is the cornerstone of the Paris Agreement. For the first time, each and every party has to put forward their own contribution. And transparency is also a precondition to raising climate ambition as because each party is putting it forward, we have to build trust overall globally and it has to build accountability for all parties. However, even though some of these uh, reporting requirements have existed for over 20 years, mostly for developed countries, many developing countries still lack the capacity to effectively track, report and enhance uh, their inventories, their NDCs, and other reporting requirements. So at COP21, when the Paris Agreement was decided and adopted, uh, parties requested the GEF to support the establishment and the operation of a CBAT. The CBAT was drafted to require three aims. First, to strengthen national institutions for transparency-related activities in line with national priorities. Second, to provide relevant tools, training, and assistance for meeting the provisions stipulated in Article 13 of the Paris Agreement. And third, to assist in the improvement of transparency over time. And these three aims is what is the backbone of our CBIT programming strategy. So the idea is to make sure that CBIT projects help countries build their national institutional arrangements, build their national capacities, have the relevant tools and training, in order to respond to the requirements of the Article 13 and to make sure that this doesn't just end there. This is a capacity building activity that will continue on 
under the Paris Agreement to make sure that transparency continues to build over time. As Lisa said, this is something that has to be built. It's not something that magically uh, happens with one little project. So with that, uh, if we can pass to the next slide, I wanted to give you a snapshot of the summary of CBIT support to date. So the Paris Agreement decision was passed in 2015. Within a year, by 2016, we had received generous donations from uh, countries to set up a CBIT trust fund and start supporting countries with CBIT projects. Since then, we've supported approximately 43, well, we've supported 43% of non-Annex 1 parties, meaning through 68 projects supporting 67 countries with over $100 million. Most of these projects are national. As you can see in the map, uh, we've colored in green the projects that are start, have started implementation, and in blue, the projects that are still at the concept stage. So they're developing their full project proposals before starting implementation. Over on the right side, we have uh, the distribution at the regional uh, side. And a, a very good balance of regions, uh, quite a number of projects in Africa and Latin America in particular, and more with our participation in Asia. So far, we've supported 19 developed countries, 10 small island developing states, and two which are both LDC and SIDS. As I mentioned, uh, already 38 projects have become implementation. So we have about half uh, projects from which we can start learning and exchanging those lessons learned with the other countries that are just starting their implementation. We also have five global projects, uh, which Pascal will discuss more about. And to date, we have had six, what we call GEF implementing agencies that have already been involved in CBIT projects, and these include obviously FAO, which we're gratefully to be a partner with on the CBIT, as well as Conservation International, the Inter-American Development Bank, United Nations Environment Program, United Nations Development Program. Next slide, please. This slide is just to discuss a little bit of what we've seen in the projects that so far we've approved that are at the country level, so national projects. And it's very important to say that these projects are completely determined nationally. So they have to respond to national priorities and they have to be aligned with countries and DCs. However, we have seen some trends which make sense uh, considering that uh, the project is aiming to raise the capacity uh, to respond to certain obligations. So we've seen uh, all projects have activities that respond to capacity building and training this can look very differently depending on the country. It can be focused on a specific sector, but mostly, for example, would be to improve the capacity to deal with the 2006 IPCC guidelines. That's a common example for us. We've also seen a lot of projects have a focus on developing further their MRV systems and institutional arrangements to be able to handle this information. So for example, that could mean uh, memorandums of understanding or data sharing agreements between different institutions at the country level. Because as we know, NDCs cover many sectors for many countries. And so for the first time, you're having to have strict agreements where you're saying this Ministry of Environment needs to receive information from the Ministry of Agriculture, from uh, the Ministry of Mines, from the Ministry of Energy. And all of this information needs to be compiled into uh, not only for inventories, but also to inform on NDC progress. Interestingly, we've seen um, so it is a requirement under the new transparency framework to track the progress of the NDC in terms of mitigation, but adaptation, even though it's optional, is obviously a priority. And we've seen that that is a priority for many LDCs and SIDS that have been supported by the CBIT. On the fewer percentages, I guess we will see uh, tracking climate finance, even though this is a new aspect of the enhanced transparency framework, we have not seen uh, many projects that have yet focused on that. And that just goes to show as well that capacities start at a different level. And that's part of the Paris Agreement, right? We're all, each country starting with a different set of capacities. And for many, the basic is strengthening the inventory and the MRV system. So the next steps, which are these additional aspects that make the transparency framework enhanced under the Paris Agreement include tracking climate finance, which is very new and which requires a lot more development, as well as, for example, uh, things that have to do with the AFALU sector, 
which we're going to be talking a lot more today, it is a very challenging sector for many countries. It's a very challenging sector anyway, but for many countries it is a priority. So we've also seen in some countries where that is a main sector for their inventories to be a, a focus. Finally, just to say that the key considerations in CBAT projects when we're looking at these proposals, in addition to ensuring that they're aligned with the requirements of the Article 13 and the country's MDC, we want to make sure that they're responding to identified capacity needs. So one example would be uh, the international consultation and analysis process that some countries have gone through once they've uh, submitted their biennial update report under the convention. We also make sure that it's aligned with coordination with other support. The GF is one partner in this, but we know that there's many other partners, not only including the FAO, but also ICAT, PATPA, et cetera, making sure that it has uh, coordination with ministries and that there's a feedback of data and information back into policy development. Because as Lisa said, it is very important that this is not just about tracking and reporting to a convention, but that this is useful to the country itself. So how can you make sure that this information feeds back to uh, the ministries to support your own NDC objectives and your development policies? And finally, linkage with the global coordination platform. So I'll pass it on to Pascal to talk more about that. You have to unmute your microphone, please. Now you can talk. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Um, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Pascal and I'm working with Milena. Uh, and concretely, we are in the team who review the projects, who ensure that the projects are aligned with uh, uh, all the requirements of, uh, of the Convention, the Paris Agreement, and, uh, and uh, also with our own uh, guidelines. Uh, so just to focus uh, very briefly on, on some, uh, some uh, AFOLU project and also on, the, on this uh, global uh, platform or global project that we have. Um, so we have uh, actually uh, indeed some projects which are uh, is, uh, exclusively focused on uh, on the AFOLU sector, as it has been uh, already mentioned uh, first by Lisa and then uh, by Milena. Uh, this is very uh, particular sector, so this justifies why we may uh, have to, to focus on this sector in particular because. Uh, as, um, some countries, uh, of course, there are many sectors, and but some in some countries uh, in the NDCs, uh, the, the the forest and agriculture sector are, are very, very, very important. So it might require this uh, this particular focus. Um, as we see, so it's only 12 projects so far out of the of the 68. So it's not uh, not that much, but. Uh, anyway, the the the, the AFOLU sector uh, can be seen uh, in all of the uh, CBIT project or nearly, nearly all because it's always there, but in some projects it is only uh, only focused on Apollo sector, so it's quite limited. Uh, surprisingly, we see mainly in Asia and, and LAC region, not, not in Africa, uh, only one I think, uh, but it's because maybe there is a very, very few projects so far, um, which is very important what we, when we review the project, uh, and uh, this I will uh, go back to what, uh, what Milena said before, uh, it's very important to 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 meet the three uh, CBIT objectives, and the last one, the transparency uh, transparency over time, is very often uh, missing and requires uh, more adjustment in the project proposal that that we that we receive. So um, this is very important when the, the project developers are submitting uh, proposals to the Jeff to really uh, ensure that all this, uh, the, the three objectives are really well uh, taken into account. And so, of course, uh, why this uh, this AFOLU uh, project is because, it, as it has been said, um, we have very specific uh, uh, issues to address in the in this sector. It's not the same tools, not the same requirements in terms of report or transparency. It's not the same uh, uh, institutional arrangements. So it requires specific uh, specific challenges. More or less, to, uh, to give an idea, and it's not specific of the of the AFOLU sector. The the average, the budget average is about 1 million 
everything, uh, everything included, one, 1.2 million. So it gives you an idea of what is what is uh, the size of this of this project. Uh, sometimes we receive proposals with much more uh, uh, resources uh, required, and uh, and this also uh, it may not be so well aligned and so so so. Uh, I mean, so, so aligned with what is really uh, what is really uh, available uh, for such kind of activities and requires some more time for the project preparation. So it's important to have this in mind. More or less, uh, and also, well, this is very key. The one LGBT criteria is a very uh, strong alignment with the, the NDCs. It is the first thing that when we review a project, the third, first thing that we will see, look at, is the NDC of the uh, of the countries. And if, for instance, we have an AFOLU proposal and the countries uh, uh, target uh, the energy sector as the main important sector, we cannot accept this kind of project. So this is very very important to to, to align with the uh, with the NDCs. And, uh, and, and uh, as regard to the global uh, project uh, that support the, the CBIT, well, first we, we are, you have to consider this as a as a as a whole, as a big community of practice to share knowledge and uh, lessons uh, at global level to make the link between what is going on on at country level and what is uh, what is then can be shared with the other countries through this uh, this past, past, uh, platform. It began. It began. Uh, the CBIT began in 20 to be implemented uh, as a Jeff. It began in 2016, uh, and um, and first uh, we we began with this first uh, CBIT global coordination platform, uh, which was launched launched in 2018, and it was the first project to set the scene to set all the important uh, elements of transparency at global level, which included the foster coordination of transparency action and needs, uh, share lessons. Uh, learn through the regional and global meetings and also facilitate access to emerging standards and guidance on transparency actions. And then it moves to a, a bigger uh, project that are now uh, being, uh, being uh, developed, uh, which is this global CBIT platform phase two, phase, phase two A and phase two B. Actually, this is the same project. It just corresponds to two different uh, uh, phase of, uh, of budgeting. Uh, so we have this global and platform which includes all these, uh, all the, the different sectors, and we have again because it's particular uh, two projects that are uh, uh, being implemented by uh, FAO, CBA, CBIT Forest, and CBIT Afolu to address the specific uh, sectors. The total budget of of this global initiative is around 13 uh, million dollars, and it is led by. Uh, three uh, agencies, UNDP, UNEP, and FAO, of course, FAO for this uh, land use related uh, project. Um, and, uh, and well, it is, it is, the objective is to facilitate uh, global no knowledge sharing through partnerships. And also this includes other global initiatives. Um, Milena mentioned briefly also this, uh, of course, we, we make the link with the uh, ICAT, with the uh, PAPTA, with NDC partnership, with PASTI, all this kind of uh, other initiatives that work uh, towards transparency uh, and climate. So we are trying to make the link, and this is a very important also for each of the national projects to link with these uh, global platforms, global initiatives, to enable to make also uh, the, the link with the others uh, global initiatives. So this is also a criteria that we will look at very strongly when we receive the project proposal, is to take into account the uh, um, relevant global platform that they need, the national project need to work with. And, and just uh, some uh, takeaway, uh, key takeaways and uh, uh, message. Uh, first, the project, the project must uh, support the national priorities and needs. Uh, this is uh, real reflected in uh, NDCs. So, uh, so this is very, very important, so this alignment. And this is not only for CBIT project for the GEF, it is globally for all, any, any project on the GEF. Uh, to link also uh, transparency, uh, it's important to link transparency with the national development agenda, of course, because if you want to, this project to be sustainable, it has to, to, to respond to, the, to, this, uh, to this need for, for alignment and this co uh, coherence with the development agenda in the country. It's very important to ensure this, the, the project is uh, by voted by uh, by the country. Um, also, as I said before, the global CBIT project are very very important to enhance uh, the partnership and and maximize learning opportunities uh, and knowledge sharing. And lastly, uh, 
Uh, what is very important also to have in mind is that uh, the CBIT support will, uh, will continue. We are open uh, for business and we, uh, every week uh, we uh, keep on uh, reviewing new proposals. So, so yes, we, uh, Jeff is continuing uh, his work on, on CBIT right now. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much to Milena and Pascal for the overview and the reflections on the extensive support provided by Jeff um, and also be between the Jeff and the FA partnership. Um, I had a few more words uh, to share, but given the time, uh, I know that our, our director at the FAO Forestry Department, Mete, has to run to another meeting. So in lieu of doing that, I will turn the floor directly to Mete and then we can continue um, to follow up after that. Mete, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Khalil, and dear speakers and participants. I'm really excited to be here today and together with colleagues of the Climate Change Secretariat and the Global Environment Facility to highlight the importance of forest data transparency. As Khalil says, I do have another appointment that I have to run to, but let me just give you a couple of remarks from my side. We've all seen heat waves and drought, scenes of flooding and storms and raging forest fires. It shows us just how much climate change affects our lives. More than anything, it threatens our ability to ensure global food security, eradicate poverty and achieve sustainable development. The global response to climate change today will determine how we feed future generations tomorrow and forests must be an integral part of this response. To reach the goal of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change to limit the rise of global temperatures to well below two degrees Celsius, we really need to take action and take action now to limit our emissions. And to do so, we need to be better informed in order to take the best decisions. For this, we need better data. We know that together with improved land management options, forests and trees could provide up to 30% of that greenhouse gas reductions that we are needed by 2030 to stay just below the two degree. And recognizing this, many developing countries have embarked already on a journey to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, the red plus. In order to help them with their planning and implementation and monitoring of their reductions, FAO support countries who wish to overcome data gaps and improve the quality and the transparency of forest related data and information. And we have a number of initiatives under which we do that. And you will hear a little bit more about those later. That forest monitoring is critical to make sure that countries stay on target with regard to their emission reduction targets. But it also helps them to redesign their policies to take into account up-to-date, reliable, transparent, and accessible information. And this is crucial. And that's why we have been working in FAO over the past many decades to help build the capacity to get that unprecedented transparency in forest data in, in addition to making sure that they are very solid. We're working with a growing number of countries so that they are now able to meet those international reporting requirements. What we've done has also helped draw some lessons for the Paris Agreement's enhanced transparency framework that you heard about already. We know that this has made a difference. Uh, 50 countries have so far submitted their forest reference emission levels and two thirds of those have been supported by FAO in doing so. Even last month, uh, we've seen red plus results submitted by Uganda, the first country in Africa to do so. And we've seen others that have already received funding from the Green Climate Fund for results uh, based on better data on their emission reductions. Here in FAO, we conduct what we call the Global Forest Resources Assessment every five years. And we just come up with the results of the 2020 assessment, the key results, the main reports coming up next Tuesday, so stay tuned. It does show us that deforestation continues, but the positive news is it is slowing down. So some actions have been taken and we have started to see the results of those. We need to make sure that that action continues and we need to make sure that it's sufficient. And to be sure of this, we need solid and transparent information. 
And as we progress towards the enhanced transparency trans uh, framework that Lisa spoke about, FAO needs to make sure that our guidance is up to date. We need to continue to provide that capacity building and knowledge sharing support to countries so that they can meet their targets and so that we can all live in a world without the worst effect of climate change. The CBIT, the Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency that we carry out for Forest and this e-learning course we're launching today are some important steps towards this goal. The COVID-19 pandemic has meant the closure of many educational and training institutions. So I'm delighted that we are launching this today on the World Youth Skills Day. Young people are those that are most demanding change or most actively demanding change. But we hope that this course will become an important tool for all those young and not so young who want to help make the changes that are required to happen. And we think that this moment in time is a good time to launch such a course. With the pandemic, it's wise to stay at home. And what better thing to do than to get stuck into material about how we can together shape a better nature positive and data driven tomorrow. Let me hand over to my colleague, Rocha, who will tell you much more about FAO's work on an open and transparent forest data. I hope you enjoy this course and wish you the best of luck. Bye. Thank you very much, uh, Mete. Um, let me share uh, the presentation. Thanks, Mete, for setting the scene and helping me highlight why forests are so important for all of us. Forests uh, play a central role in combating climate change uh, by absorbing and storing carbon from the atmosphere in their vegetation and soils. Therefore, given the significant climate change mitigation potential of forests, Improving the transparency of forest-related data and information within the enhanced transparency framework of the Paris Agreement is timely, indeed urgent, in order to translate this potential into action. A fully functioning multi-purpose national forest monitoring system allow countries to track progress on climate action and effectively report on forest-related emissions and removals as well as respond to their own forest data needs. We tailor national forest monitoring systems. Countries are able to develop informed forest and land use policies with proven knowledge and up-to-date, transparent and accessible information. Building an NFMS is a complex national scale effort that must consider multiple institutional technical and financial aspects. The system should increase transparency, reliability of information produced and ensure a long-term perspective through participatory processes that include multiple stakeholders with different skills who must be identified and informed throughout. Ultimately, national forest monitoring systems can help countries to meet the requirements of the ETF. Building partnerships helps ensure the impact of forest monitoring support, including with intergovernmental and governmental organizations, resource partners, universities, and civil society, especially John, women and men. Efforts to support forest monitoring should focus on strengthening the development of an NFMS. But how is FAO contributed to efforts toward the implementation of the Paris Agreement in the forest sector? Building global capacity to increase transparency in the forest sector, so-called CBIT forest, is a two-year project of the FAO financed by the CBIT Trust Fund of the Global Environment Facility, aiming to strengthen the institutional and technical capacities of developing countries to collect 
analyze and disseminate forest related data. It will support countries in meeting the ETF requirements of the Paris Agreement and contribute with information necessary to track progress made in implementing and achieving the national determined contributions. This CBIT project is built on already existing efforts of the FAO to support countries on forest monitoring at global and national levels. Therefore, this project is being implemented by FAO's Global Forest Resource Assessment and the National Forest Monitoring Teams, this last one already supporting 70 countries in their forest monitoring to ensure more sustainable forest management and better reporting. But how are we doing that? By organizing uh, sub-regional and national workshops across Asia and Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean to build countries and sub-regions capacity to enhance their national forest monitoring system. 26 countries targeted, as well as 187 countries and territories included as part of the global network of national correspondents for the Global Forest Resource Assessment. Up to the 30th of June, 231 individuals, 68% men and 32% women from around 20 institutions in six pilot countries, including Honduras, Guatemala, Uganda, Cote d'Ivoire, Thailand and Laos, have been consulted and involved virtually up to now. Strengthening the network of key partners such as the UNFCCC, the Global Forest Observation Initiative, UNEP, UNDP, by seeking cooperation to work on products or activities of the project. Upgrading FAO's Global Forest Resource Assessment 2020 reporting and dissemination platform to make forest data reporting easier in the future. Developing a spreadsheet based tool to facilitate the assessment of gaps and needs in countries' national forest monitoring system building and maintaining continuous awareness of the project using our webpage, which includes news and information resources. We have also identified case studies from Costa Rica, Bangladesh, and the, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which are already uh, ready to be shared. Our material is aimed variously at policymaker, technical experts, students, and anyone interested in transparency in the forest sector. Last but not least, developing the e-learning course to enable access to knowledge about the ETF and forests to anyone, anywhere. And just uh, before presenting the e-learning models, let me share with you some of the publications which includes the flyer of the project, case studies, the poster, and the brief info of the National Forest Monitoring Assessment Tool. All this material will shortly be available in multiple languages. With this slide, I would like to introduce some key information related to the e-learning on forests and transparency under the Paris Agreement. You will learn about the role and importance of forests in tackling climate change, how the ETF under the Paris Agreement can be addressed in the forest sector, and how the national forest monitoring systems can help countries to meet the requirements of the ETF. The course contains three models and will take one hour, 30 minutes to finalize it. A free of charge and soon multiple language courses will be accessible online or downloadable. Here you have the link for the English version. And before moving, ahead with the models, let me mention that a series of technical experts from the FAO and the UNFCCC have largely contributed to this effort, as well as other institutions such as the IPCC, UNDP, UNEPDTU, among others. Let's fastly navigate into these models. The first model will explain how we are moving from the measurement reporting verification frameworks toward the enhanced transparency framework under the Paris Agreement, but also reviews the fundamental role of forests and how they are related to the ETF. The second model reviews the goal and the scope of a national forest monitoring system and presents key guidance elements to strengthen national forest monitoring capacities 
increasing their transparency and long-term reliability. Let me highlight that at the end of this module, you will be able to download the new National Forest Monitoring System assessment tool I mentioned previously. It is free, Excel-based Excel tool available already in English, French, and Spanish. The last model discussed how National Forest Monitoring System enable countries to produce reliable and transparent data and thus contribute with the ETF. Let me highlight that this model is sharing country examples, but has also included case studies from different regions. Join us to the upcoming webinar to be held on the 21st of July if you want to learn more details on Costa Rica case study. I would like to thank you very much for your attention and participation. Today we were around 30, 300 participants. I would also like to thank colleagues from the FAO that have contributed to this global effort. And let me end by saying that the World Youth Skills Day 2020 is taking place in a challenging context. However, I'm looking ahead that the FAO and the United System and partners can support the world to build back better by working together. Training is key. Thank you. Lovely, thank you so much uh, to Mete for the warm and heartfelt opening remarks and also to Rocio for the overview of the CBIT Forest Project. And of course, for walking us through, I think some of the preliminary uh, lessons that the e-learning course provides to students. Um, now, luckily we've been surprisingly very much so on time. So we leave ourselves with a full half an hour for discussion and for questions and answers. And I can see that the, the Q&A box below has been filled up. And we also have some, some discussion questions planned. Um, now, as we move into the, to the discussion, and given that today is World Youth Skills Day, I would like to invite my friends from the International Forestry Students Association, IFSA, and specifically the president, Mr. Amos Amanubo, to provide a statement as well as start us off uh, by posing the first question to the panel. Amos, we're always happy to collaborate with IFSA and we thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Khalil, for the invitation. Uh, if it's always proud to be part of such initiatives and it's of course a great pleasure to be part of this remarkable day and this remarkable initiative. I mean, students and learners have been mentioned several times and this is only the beginning. Uh, the International Forestry Students Association is a globally organized and locally operating student organization through the different commissions. You can simply put it IFSA through the different commissions, IFSA connects forestry students to their peers and forest-related organizations and policy platforms, thereby acting as a knowledge hub. We connect thousands of students and young professionals in the forestry sector around the world to share experiences, prepare them to meet the needs of the ever-evolving and dynamic forest sector. Through our Capacity Development Commission, we seek opportunities to develop the skills of IFSA officials and members and create new learning content through our different subcommissions to broaden the knowledge of our members. IFSA has a tried and tested record of shaping the development of, of forest education and knowledge management, more so in collaboration with some of its professional global and regional partners. Having previously successfully worked with a number of of teams in FAO on forest education, the launch of the e-learning platform provides IFSA with yet another opportunity to broaden the horizon of its impact in forest education and capacity development, also enabling it to therefore uniquely and directly contribute to the goals that the Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency, the CBIT, aims to achieve with reference to the Paris Climate Agreement. If that takes delight and, and pleasure in being part of this initiative and promoting it without limits, not only to build capacity of its members or learners around the world, but also to create a world that appreciates forests. This is something that's coherent with the vision of IFSA. So then I come to my selected question to Roshu. I'd like to ask you, Ms. Roshu, as 
the program co coordinator of the CBIT, forest program. The CBIT shortly mentioned points at knowledge transfer and access, the e-learning initiative and information sharing as a key step towards achieving enhanced transparency and capacity. However, we have noticed that COVID-19 has demonstrated how learning and knowledge transfer institutions are vulnerable due to the technological underdevelopment in LDCs, least developed countries, for which the CBIT and the Paris Climate Agreement place a high consideration. We note a failure to cope up with virtual learning in this category of countries. As students studying forests and its related impact on climate change and biodiversity, to name, to name a few, how will this course help us make more climate action? How will it help us take more climate action? And what are the tangible benefits for students to partake in this e-learning course, students or learners? And just to follow up, how prepared are the initiatives and the involved definitive partners or stakeholders in this course to make the information access and knowledge transfer effective in the unfortunate event that COVID is here to stay or other limited aforementioned shortcomings such as technological underdevelopment or low internet bandwidth in, in least developed countries. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you first Amos uh, um, and thank you also other IFSA colleagues for attending today. Uh, and thank also for your important question. Uh, we are excited to have young people here with us, um, and especially uh, on World Youth Skill Day. We understand the value of building capacity at all levels to ensure that no one is left behind, and all are capable of taking action. To answer your question simply, this course was designed with you in mind. It serves to clarify not only why forests are an extremely important solution to climate crisis, but the farther the breakdown and walk participants through an important global agreement such as the Paris Agreement, which has complexity and nuisance. The course can help participants, country colleagues and students to better understand and ingest some of the actions taken by their governments to enhance forest data and transparency. The three models I presented try to focus on how the global decisions connect to the national context, where ultimately action can take place at a global level and through civil society. We know more than ever that distance training is essential and common way of imparting uh, skills, especially those with considerable difficulties. We also know that young youth unemployment is high. And if youth are expected to adapt and contribute to the recovery effort, they will need to be equipped with the right skills and even more resilience. Our hope is that this course and our further work helps to begin to eliminate any perceived barrier to action and also further show how open and transparent data is critical to that aspiration. Uh, thank you almost so much for the intervention. As mentioned, we always love to collaborate with IFSA and to have young foresters and young climate activists with us. Um, I see the questions are now rolling in. I think people have found the Q&A box. We have over 24 questions, um, but we've still got some time together. So to start off the broader dialogue, I wanted to go back to Lisa uh, from the UNFCCC um, and start at a broader aspect of our dialogue. Uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, and I've also read that Article 13 in the Paris Agreement really underpins many of the other articles that are set out and can really be viewed as fundamental to supporting successful implementation. So the question is, would you be able to say a few words on Article 13, um, how the CIBIT projects enhance national capacities? And related to that, there was a question that was posed from the floor by Natalie Faure, uh, apologies for my pronunciation, um, which says, can you also talk about some of the key challenges that you uh, encounter when implementing ETF in practice? Thank you, Khalil. This is a very good question. Um, I, 
the Article 13 is related to many articles of the Paris Agreement because it's about the provision of information. It's about the provision of information about what a country is doing with respect to greenhouse gas emissions and removals, policies and actions, their finance needs. Um, it's, it's conveying in an open manner um, what, what, what is being done to achieve the nationally determined contribution. Um, and, and this is a very important year in 2020 with countries communicating their updated NDCs. And it's sort of the start of transparency because it's important that those communications are also clear and transparent and that those actions are then tracked over time. Um, this will be conveyed in the first BTR in 2024 at the latest. <laughs> um, and so the, the information, it's important to, to start now. And, and that's why I think CBIT is so important. Um, capacity building is going to be key and creating the institutions to support this process will be key. Um, you were talking about some of the challenges and from the party side, I think the establishment of a sustainable system for um, collecting data, reporting data um, over time is, is one of the key challenges now and it will continue to be a, a key challenge. And it's, um, it's good that we see so much interest. And I, I saw 100% of uh, Milena's graph was related to, to institutional and capacity building. It's, it's the heart of it. Um, I think another key challenge from a party's perspective will be just data collection. I mean, we've seen it in the inventory world that that's one of the, the main challenges. And again, that's why I liked this course is it talks about the importance of collecting data for multiple, multiple reasons. Um, I, just to respond to Natalie's question a little bit more, I think an, another challenge we see um, from our side and what we're, we're really working from on the Secretariat side is to help prepare countries. Um, it seems like 2024 is a long time away, but it's not. It takes time to build these systems. Um, and so I think um, we're looking at ways to, um, to help countries. We hope countries will come to us and, 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 and identify ways we can, we can work with them further. Um, yeah, I think, uh, and I guess the, maybe the final comment would be um, that the best preparation for the enhanced transparency framework is participation now. About 57 developing countries have submitted their BUR at this stage. Um, and so we hope to see more in the, in the coming years and start transitioning that to the BTRs. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. Uh, and then maybe staying broad in scope, um, I wanted to go to our colleagues, Pascal and Milena uh, from the GEF. Um, in your presentation, I think you gave a really nice overview of the, the sort of full support that the GEF provides through the CIBIT portfolio and how those break down, um, as well as highlighting some of the complexity of achieving transparency within these different sectors that the GEF funds. Um, I think you stated that currently uh, the GEF funds 68 CIBIT projects and channels resources to both national level projects, least developed countries. And of course, there's the five global CIBIT projects of which the, the CBIT forest is one. So can you sort of unwrap this a bit more, this complexity? How do these projects differ in their objectives? And I suppose, how do they kind of aggregate uh, into a pathway that leads to eventually to enhance transparency? Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that's a very important question because obviously, it's kind of how the whole Paris Agreement is working, right? It's in response to national priorities and each country has to put forward their part, but how is it gonna work globally to make sure that we're advancing together? I think uh, with CBAT projects, what we're seeing is it's absolutely important to help national and countries through these national projects to develop their own institutional arrangements and capacities, because that is, they have to play a part in this wider scope that Lisa uh, explained. So it's very important for them to develop their own technical capacity for data collection, for inventories, for tracking, to be able to participate in the enhanced transparency framework. So most of our funding is going to national projects because of that. However, we have found that there are certain areas where additional, uh, let's say, either technical development needs to be carried out, such as in the forestry sector, which is why we have these global projects that are trying to fill in those gaps for topics where perhaps a wider network and additional and technical uh, explorations through technical capacity building, such as these very important course, have to be carried out. So we have found that with forestry and with the FLU sectors, that's why we have those two really key global projects uh, that FAO is implementing. And then on the wider scale, we have the global platform, 
which aims to provide additional spaces for exchange, knowledge sharing between regions. So we can see, for example, there, we have certain projects in certain regions that, are, that have similar challenges. So we want them to talk to each other and share how they're, you know, how, you know, wh how are you developing your indicators for adaptation? Which sectors are you focusing on? These kinds of exchanges are really important. So that's why we've set up the global platform so that we can encourage those types of exchanges at the regional level, as well as at the global level, and try to identif identify additional needs and gaps that may, might be surging as countries go on these national tracks. So perhaps they didn't realize that scenario modeling uh, was gonna be tougher, that it was an area of need. And so now we can decide whether or not we want additional support on a priority area that we hadn't identified before. Uh, so I think that, that kind of explains your question. Yeah, thanks. No, I think uh, riffing off sort of what you've just uh, spoken about, but also what Lisa covered, that countries are really starting off at different places, as we know, with capacity and with institutional arrangements. Uh, and it, it points to a program and, and, and funding which really needs to be flexible and, and focuses on learning and, and learning from each other, uh, really to address the complexity of what transparency is. Um, so then I'll, I'll ask you again, Milena and Pascal, um, within that, that global portfolio, how does the Jeff ensure that data is being shared, that the lessons are being learned um, through the project impl implementation, but really that countries are, are learning from their neighbors and that they're uh, collectively building capacity together. So one of the key ways that we do that is we ensure that all projects have activities that are focused on knowledge management, knowledge sharing, and participating not only in the global platform, but also in the regional uh, networks that we have. So that is really, really important. If you don't give it a budget, then you know you you can't ensure that it's going to happen. And obviously, there's a lot of different priorities and activities that need to that need to be carried out. So that is one way. And another way is to keep trying to support countries through the additional partners that we have in this area. So, as I said in my presentation, the Jeff is not the only uh, partner in this. We have ICAT, we have PATPA. We have all of the agencies that are working through the Jeff projects, but they also have their own activities, um, webinars such as this. So we try to just raise awareness and, and continue our outreach to make sure that this knowledge sharing is reaching as many different stakeholders as possible. Great, thanks, Milena. Um, yeah, just to mention colleagues, uh, all of the questions, we're gonna do our best to address them. And I'll bring them up sort of in the related uh, discussion question as well. So I see that there's a question uh, that is on coronavirus and how it's linked to climate change. We'll do our best to address these upvoted questions. Um, and any questions that we do not address, just for everyone's knowledge, we will share with the panelists and do our best to get back to you in written form as well. So hopefully no one's worried. But um, yeah, uh, again, riffing off what you've said, Milena, I think it's really important that we're creating sort of learning networks um, and we're using the opportunity for workshops and meetings to kind of build a community of practice. And that's really critical for sort of trial and error and so that these communities begin to learn and build capacity. But I want to hone in a little bit more on the role um, that forests play and um, building off a question that was asked by uh, Mr. Armando Alanes from Mexico. Um, as we now transition from this role of MRV, measurement reporting and verification, towards the new enhanced transparency framework. Uh, traditionally, Red Plus and Forest have sort of, um, well, they've sat under this MRV. And now with, as we move to ETF, well, how are those changes gonna arise? Um, where do these reporting elements now sit? Uh, do they get reported under the enhanced transparency framework? And what do you think then the main challenges for countries will be during this transition? Uh, thank you. That's to me, right? <laughs> That's to you, Lisa. Yes, sir. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, this is. I think this is a very important question. And uh, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries. This whole Red Plus framework. Um, it's it's one of the biggest opportunities for reductions, um, particularly in the AFLU sector. Um, and the Warsaw framework um, has been evolving over the years and we're seeing more and more countries that are starting to participate in the process. I think Meta uh, responded to this in, in her presentation um, that there are now 50 countries who have submitted Red Plus um, results and at, or a, a, a framework uh, forest reference level. And so you can see more and more countries are getting involved in the process. 
Now those um, red plus results are uh, attached to the BUR, the biannual update report. Um, this is just going to transition. They'll, instead of transitioning or attached to the current BUR, they'll be attached to the BTR as an annex to the biennial transparency report. The requirements don't change. Um, and so it's just transitioning to a new vehicle for reporting. And so this is why we try to emphasize again and again <laughs> that the best way to prepare for the enhanced transparency framework is really to start now and, and to start becoming uh, aware of the requirements to develop the capacities to do the reporting now. Um, in the case of Red Plus, there, there are no uh, real changes between now and, and under the Paris Agreement. Um, and so I think we, we should only see increased um, participation in these activities over the years. It is a complex sector. I think all of us who have been involved in the reporting realm know that LULICF and forestry, it's complex. And so um, working now will, will, will provide the, the foundation for the future. So thanks. Thanks, yeah. Um, and then building off that, um, maybe we can turn to Rocio for a question now. Um, of course, Rocio, the National Forest Monitoring Systems are a fundamental pillar in support of the Red Plus uh, framework and the Red Plus program. Um, and in your presentation, I think you gave a really nice overview of how, um, how important transparent forest data is to reporting to the F Paris Agreement, uh, as well how the CIPIT Forest Project aims to enhance the M NFMS through collaborating with country partners. So I was hoping you could share with us some of the experiences within your pilot countries and also maybe highlight the tool that you've also developed, which complements the e-learning course uh, and how this is helping countries to prioritize their actions. Thank you very much, uh, Khalil. Uh, well, first of all, maybe uh, just to briefly uh, share with you that the tool uh, provides uh, an assessment of the National Forest Monitoring System. Uh, about key good practices aggregated in three uh, categories, institutional arrangements, measurement estimation, and reporting and verification. Um, this tool facilitates the identification of uh, needs and gaps in order to establish and strengthen uh, countries' forest monitoring. Therefore, it can be used by countries at various starting points. While working with pilot countries to the project, we have seen that the tool has a facilitated capacity assessment of the system and facilitation of dialogue with national key stakeholders, helping uh, to tool their first-hand knowledge of a problem or development challenge and identify possible solutions. It also helped to identify the opportunities uh, for improvement of the National Forest Monitoring System. In addition, the tool has facilitated understanding of FAO's voluntary guidance on National Forest Monitoring and has helped also to build work plans together with stakeholders and partners. So I, I, I think um, that experience we are uh, getting um, with the pilot countries is helping us uh, tailor better the products and all the activities we have to implement uh, in the coming months. Thank you, Halil. Back to you. Yeah, thanks, Rocio. Yeah, so the tool, uh, I think, as you mentioned, really helps to identify the alignment under those three broad categories, but maybe most importantly, really prioritizes the actions that need to be taken to um, improve the National Forest Monitoring System. And I think it really highlights the importance that both the public and decision makers have access to the most accurate, transparent and timely forest data um, so we can understand not only the current status of our forests, but how do they compare globally? Um, and I think this is related to the next question I wanted to ask and relates to a question that was posed by one of the colleagues in the chat, um, which is why despite a vast network and fund availability, why haven't we seen a desired change globally? So I wanna go back to Lisa for, for this question. Um, Lisa, can you elaborate for us? I mean, we mentioned, I think, how the enhanced transparency in Article 13 um, sort of have the compliance angle, but is there really, uh, the ETF is also sold as this way to build ambition and further climate action. So perhaps you can elaborate more how, beyond allowing countries to compare to one another, why does it help countries be more ambitious with their climate proposals? Yeah, thank you. Um, and actually, the UNFCCC just released a publication yesterday looking at the ICA process, the International Consultation and Analysis process, and that's for the developing countries and the BURs. And it 
highlights how transparency has boosted mitigation action. And it's, and it's really because transparency is about being an open book. You're providing the information to the public. Um, the compliance um, regime, as you said, under the Paris Agreement, it's facilitative, um, but there's also the kind of the public opinion. You're pre presenting all of your information out there. Um, it's being reviewed. Um, countries are then showcasing what they're doing. Um, and so there's an opportunity to, to um, you know, kind of collectively see where you're, where you're going. And so um, it enhances ambition because you, you, you're kind of accountable to the, to the court of public opinion. Um, and, and you can see over time whether you need to enhance the ambition. Um, there's a, having this information open and available is, a, is an important step to see you know, collectively. I think Malena mentioned this in her presentation, if collectively all countries are doing enough. And if they're not doing enough, there'll be pressure to enhance ambition um, internally. Um, and that will then be shown through the next uh, nationally determined contribution. So I think the, the transparency uh, leads to in, enhanced ambition. Right. So it, it's, Thanks. I mean, superficially, it's more than just the compliance, but of course, it's this facilitative process. And then in the court of public opinion, which holds everyone accountable and, and provides more ambitious ambition for climate action. Exactly. Uh, but that'd be yeah. interesting to, to read that new publication by Yuka as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're at 3.55, but I think it's important that we address maybe the most upvoted question um, on COVID and the impacts of COVID. So to do that, I, I wanted to go back to the Jeff. Um, and I think it's important to ask about really the impact uh, of COVID on the discussion of climate action. Uh, and there's been many dialogues on this. Uh, FAO Forestry had a webinar uh, in the middle of June, also discussing sort of the broader impacts of COVID on the forestry sector. Um, and, and of course, the, the, the impacts are, are far reaching and there have been some silver linings of positivity with, um, I read this morning that, that COVID could potentially trigger the largest ever annual fall in CO2 emissions, but we know this is perhaps more of a blip than an overall trend. So as we begin to think about the economic restart and we begin to think about the impacts it can have on climate ambition, uh, perhaps I can go to Pascal on this one, as an operating entity of the UNFCCC, uh, as a financial mechanism, and a key <clears> stakeholder <throat> in funding opportunities, where do you see the most urgent need for catalytic, catalytic investments in nature and overall for climate action? Thank you, Khalil. Uh, actually, it's a very complex question, and uh, it's much broader than the uh, transparency framework and, and even climate action, I think. Um, indeed, yes, we we, we see that uh, the first quick recovery packages that we are hearing about are not very encouraging in terms of uh, green packages. Actually, uh, uh, I think except two or three countries and European Union, uh, there is very limited uh, action that tends to, to try to, to promote uh, green uh, packages and which include uh, nature. So, so yes, we, we, we really need to, to think about it. And, uh, and to Jeff, well, the Jeff is, is a very well positioned for this, uh, this kind of reflection because we, we are promoting the, the environment conservation in general, which include climate change, but not only. Um, this uh, <coughs> pandemic uh, came from, a, from, a, from the interface between uh, nature and, uh, and human. So, it's very important to try to tackle the issue of uh, environmental degradation, which lead to more and more contact with, uh, uh, with nature uh, and increase uh, the, the risk. So I think uh, some very important investment in the future must be related to nature. So nature-based solution may be a, a good uh, uh, area to, to think about. I think also the resilience is very important to take into account in uh, climate adaptation. Uh, also, because it's a lack of resilience, uh, which uh, lead to a further environmental degradation with kind of this kind of, uh, of pandemic. And here, the CBIT, because of this transparency and uh, this capacity of improving the, the knowledge of what's going on with the forest in terms of deforestation, degradation of forest, this capacity of tracking what's going on uh, in the field, I think it's a have a, a, a role to play, uh, which can be also uh, useful for this, uh, for this thing. And the Jeff uh, is already working at project level, how to see we can, uh, we can uh, uh, further design and implement the, the ongoing proposals 
we are work, working also with the country uh, themselves uh, to see what would they need uh, and what could be programmed in the uh, with Jeff resources that would be aligned with Jeff requirements and also responded to the crisis crisis. And we have to also to have in mind that very soon we'll begin the the negotiation uh, for the Jeff eight cycle from 2022-2026. So and this uh, will be an opportunity to take into account uh, with the further ongoing discussions what can be done re uh, to try to limit the risk of further uh, uh, crisis like this. So yes, it's 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 an ongoing reflection. We are trying to do uh, our best with uh, with our position. We are well positioned, with position, but um, I think it's uh, it's very difficult to have a, a, def a definitive uh, answer at this point uh, on the situation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so so much, Pascal, for the for the reflections. Um, and colleagues, I'm very aware that we are now coming upon the hour. Um, so allow me to take us from the very broad question of the impact of COVID on forests and generally the AFOLU sector, back to what we're actually here for today, which was the launching of the, the three e-learning courses. So I wanted to turn the last word and perhaps the last question to Rocio. Uh, Rocio, let me start by congratulating you and the team for all the hard work that you've done uh, in collaboration with the e-learning academy. Um, to launch the, the three e-learning modules. Um, but perhaps you can give us a sneak peek of what's next. So we've done this work, we, we have this uh, e-learning course, and of course we encourage everyone to go take the, the courses, but uh, perhaps you can give us a sneak peek of what's next. Uh, thank you very much, Khalil. And um, just to share, to, to let you know that um, uh, capacity development often involves uh, enhancing the knowledge and skills of individuals uh, whose work results greatly rely on the performance of the organization in which they work. Therefore, the project will contribute and assist in the improvement of transparency skills over time with different interventions, including self-paced e-learning in multiple languages, um, blended uh, learning activities, technical webinars, and massive open online course. The second call of the year. We are already working with the FAO eLearning Academy to launch the MOOC, aiming to involve men and women from our pilot countries and a large number of countries as well as young students to facilitate knowledge exchange on forest and transparency. We will also aim to participate uh, to key global events to share knowledge including the upcoming World Forestry Congress to be held in May 2021 in the Republic of Korea. Last Congress actually brought together 4,000 participants for, from 138 uh, countries. Thanks, back to you. Thanks so much, Rocio. There's a lot of exciting news from all of our panelists, which is great. And, and again, I think we're quickly running out of time, so I'll take a moment just to wrap up quickly. I'll start by thanking all of our panelists for contributing to the rich dialogue and really uh, unpacking what is a, a complex global process and helping many of us move towards a better understanding of the work of the CBIT, the CBIT forest, and really the fundamental contribution to increased climate action. Um, a few key messages that uh, I picked up throughout the session that resonated were uh, better and clearer data clearly helps countries see how they how individually they're globally responding to climate crisis as well as rewarding ambitious efforts um, that I think this was reiterated a few times that estimating emissions and removals from the sector is complex very complex and as such programs such as those funded through the Jeff and those implemented by FAO are imperative to supporting and improving data collection um, and that finally enhanced transparency plays a fundamental role in increasing in increasing ambition it creates an open book it creates an even playing field and allows for further collective learning uh, through which a community and countries can showcase their successes and their failures and learn from one another. So as we wrap up, um, I'd like to ask for three things. The first one is please do go and take the e-learning course. Our colleagues have worked very hard on that. Uh, the second is to take the final poll so we understand how you plan to use the e-learning course. Um, and finally, to join us next week, we will be taking this global dialogue um, to the national context as we join our colleagues from Costa Rica and to look at their national forest monitoring and land use system. Um, with that, I'll say thank you very much from my side and I will turn the floor over to uh, Cristina Petraki for the closing remarks. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, Khalil. Uh, I just wanted to ask if it's possible to uh, put back the slide with the links to the courses so then uh, people can have access to them, if possible. Thank you. Yes, no, as, uh, as basically mentioned in all the different presentations, 
what we need, yes, of course, is reliable data, but we also need to develop the capacities of professionals, which are then able to basically act and, and, uh, uh, and integrate them and convert them into appropriate policies, sustainable actions and interventions. So I think that uh, what we really need is competent professionals. And by, um, this is why um, I wanted to mention that the FAO eLearning Academy uh, offers uh, uh, in all of these uh, e-learning courses, which are all competency-based courses. And I wanted to underline this, which means that we need to really look at the professional profiles that are required and on the competences that are needed. And, uh, uh, and all the courses, um, in, and in all the courses, we really look into all of uh, the, the, the skills, but also the competence that are needed. I also wanted to mention that uh, the FAO eLearning Academy is not only self-paced eLearning courses, but also a number of activities, as also mentioned but by Rocio, we will be doing a, a MOOC, a massive open online course on uh, the transparency framework. And um, I also wanted to mention that there are a number of other courses that could be actually very relevant to all of you, courses related to all the, the various challenges that humanity is facing. So food losses, food waste, uh, nutrition, sustainable food value chains, uh, sustainable food systems, but also climate smart agriculture and a number of other thematic areas that could be of interest. However, to go back to our thematic area today, uh, uh, we have listed here for you a number of forestry related courses that could be highly relevant. We start with the one that we are launching today, but uh, we have also uh, a course on the uh, sustainable development goal indicators, 1511 and 1521, that could also be of interest, and uh, um, a course on climate smart forestry and a number of other courses related to forestry that you can see here. I would like to conclude this excellent launch uh, by thanking uh, the, the colleagues from uh, UNF uh, C. Uh, Jeff, of course, also the FAO colleagues that have been involved on, uh, in the development of the course and also uh, in the um, organization of this event, um, but also our partners behind the scenes, Agrinium and UNSCAP, uh, the colleagues that have been uh, working behind the scenes on the platform, which are Fabio Picinic, um, uh, Aristide Bucare, and Sara Ferrante, and our excellent also uh, moderator, Khalil, uh, well, um, Khalil <laughs> Walji. And, uh, and of course, all of you, thank you all very much for attending uh, th this webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>